according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Glory to you. Be attentive. At that time, as Jesus passed on, he saw Levi, the son of Elphias, sitting at the tax office and said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed Jesus. And as Jesus sat at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were sitting with him, and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Glory to you, O Lord. Glory to you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High. And the Eight years ago, when I got ordained into the priesthood, my first service in Hollywood, Florida, was on Wednesday of Holy, the Wednesday of Holy Unction during Holy Week. That was my very first service I served. My first Sunday as a priest and my official location was Pasco. And then my second Sunday was, of course, the Thomas Sunday. One of the first sermons I ever gave, I always remember, and I know I've talked about this before, but I remember my spiritual father telling me a story when I was in school. Father Nick de Fila, the president of Hellenic College Holy Cross, took me on as his spiritual son, and he told me, when he got ordained, that the first time that the altar boy handed him the censer, that he kissed the altar boy's hand. Right? And I've never forgot that story. I've never forgot that day when he actually told me that story. Because it made me remember something. And that, what I remember, is that never to forget where you come from. Never forget where you started out. Oftentimes, as a priest that I've been serving now for eight years, going on now my ninth year, starting my ninth year, sometimes my pride gets the best of me. Sometimes I expect more out of people than they are capable of giving. Can they do it? Yes, I, I will never stop believing that people are capable of more. But they are only capable of giving what they can. And oftentimes I forget that. One of the scenes in Man of God about St. Nectarios, St. Nectarios is being pressured to become patriarch, the next patriarch. And St. Nectarios tells them why would you want that for me? Don't you realize what Satan will do to me once I become patriarch? The level of pride, the level of the lack of humility that people go through as they raise in the ranks of the church becomes sometimes unbearable. And sometimes we as fathers, sometimes we forget that we were once kids. We expect more because we have more wisdom, we have more knowledge. 
We have more understanding. And we expect our children to be something that they're not capable of being because we've attained that place. We expect that of our kids, no matter how old they are. They are. I have a 27-year-old son, and I forget that the journey that I was on. There is at one point where I remember when I was in school, my spiritual father went through a really big, huge heart, heartache in, in the church. He was actually pulled out of the church. I got so mad at the diocese. I got so mad at the church that I didn't go to church for nearly three years. I didn't step foot in the church for three years. Sometimes I forget that. I left, and I was angry, and I was ticked off because of the injustice that it was. And I forgot about that, and I forget about that sometimes. Because every one of us are on this journey. Every one of us comes to Christ. Now, the example that I set forth means something, just like the example I set forth as a dad and as a father, and as a father of the church and a spiritual father, and the example that all of us that have children, the dads in this place, we set an example and we set the tone for our home. But oftentimes we forget that we were broken and are broken. On Wednesday night when we had the class about the Jesus prayer and we practiced, we actually did practice doing the Jesus prayer and using the the Kukustini, the prayer rope. And somebody asked me, but why should I say Jesus Christ, the Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner? I don't. I know that I sin, but I know that I'm redeemed. And the answer truly is, it reminds us. It reminds us that we are sinners. It reminds us that we need to be careful about where we go with our pride. Because one of the things that is the most beneficial for us as Christians is our humility. And one of the greatest weapons that we have against Satan is humility. Our humility makes Satan flee. But oftentimes, we get nudged into the right direction only to do the wrong thing. We become prideful and we become people that we don't even realize that we're becoming because it's a slow and gradual process of brokenness that we don't even realize happens. And then when somebody wounds us, we forget. We forget that we are sinners and we forget that we were once somebody that might have wounded somebody else and then lo and behold, before you know it, we don't forgive people. And we Hold that forgiveness back. See, we as Christians are supposed to be the light of the world, but oftentimes we bury our light under a basket, right? What did Jesus say? Don't bury that under a basket. Don't hide it. But oftentimes we hide it. We don't even realize that we're doing it because we hide it underneath pride and we hide it underneath self-glorification and we hide it underneath selfishness. As I've said many times, I've realized in the last few months, especially this Lent, how truly selfish I have been much of my life. And I heard an interesting statement that said, if we truly became the people that Christ wanted us to be, imagine <coughs> what we would be able to do. There have been some people... I have encountered throughout my ministry, there has been some people that I've encountered out throughout my life, right? We joke about it. We call them the CEOs of Orthodoxy, right? Their commitment to the church as CEOs of Orthodoxy consists of coming for Christmas, Easter, and the Sunday of Orthodoxy. That's the three times maybe that they come to church in order to fulfill the check mark on their spiritual walk with God. And then there's other people 
that their check mark with God is coming every Sunday. And then the rest of the week, they can do whatever they want. But Sunday, when they're here, they are Christians. But on Monday morning, or even sometimes Sunday afternoon, they revert right back. And then I get to ask the question, Father, why do you do so many services during the week? Why do you do liturgy during the week? Why do you do Vespers? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Why do you do this? Well, let me ask you this question. Today in the reading, Jesus makes an interesting statement when he calls Levi, or Matthew, the tax collector, who becomes, of course, one of the people that writes the Gospel of Matthew, one of the people that are shunned as outcasts. And Jesus makes a statement to the Pharisees and says that I have come to call the sinners to repentance, not the righteous. Now, if the church is considered a hospital, and we as sinners are sick with sin, and we're poisoned with sin, how on earth can anyone ask, why do you have church more than one week? Is a hospital, an emergency room only open once a week? Is a dialysis center only open once a week for their patients? Once a week? But yet we as Christians think that we need to only be open once a week because that is all we need. And then we wonder why the state of our life is in shambles. We look at people across the country and we see brokenness across the country. We see people. I have had friends of mine throughout my life who have been drug addicts, alcoholics. I have seen all my friends, as I said, in the prison at one time or another. I have seen different people broken, and I've, and I've always tried to remember that I was at maybe one time where they were at or in a variable place. And throughout time, I'm down to about three of those guys that I talked to out of the 30 or 40 that God had in my life at that time, I'm down to about three. And they call me. And not only am I their friend, and not only am I my, my their brother, but now they've taken on a whole new look to me as priest in their life. But I never once demand for them to call me father. I never once demand for them to give me that respect. But yet, one of my brothers, when he calls me, he says, I'm really struggling. I want to leave my wife. And I'm saying, you know, you're not going to do that. You're not going to leave your wife because you're going to forgive her for the thing. But she's done this to me so many times, Dimitri. Brother, she's done this to me so many times. I said, yeah, but how many times have you sinned and went to God even on the same day and asked him to forgive you for the thing that you did that morning? I said, didn't Jesus teach us that we're supposed to forgive 70 times 7? Remember, the number seven is perfection. We're supposed to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. And we, in modern day mind and sensibility, when we have a spouse that doesn't do exactly what we want them to do, we get angry because they're not performing and acting how we may have been once because they're not there spiritually where we are. We may be light years ahead of them in our walk with God. But in the case of humility and forgiveness, where they need that, they need that ultimate forgiveness and they need that ultimate humility to say, I love you no matter what you're doing, just like Jesus does for me. We can't do it. Because we've been wounded and we've been hurt. See, oftentimes we see these guys that become police officers, right? We have these horror stories of cops that end up doing horrible things and doing things that shine a bad light on the police department because they've forgotten who they once were. And teachers forget that they were once students. Parents forget that they were once kids. And priests, I'm telling you for sure, forget that they were once the altar boy. We forget where we came from. 
And the mercy that we give our children is the mercy that God's going to give us. But yet we expect our children to understand and go way above what we expect them to do because we are here and we want them to be who we want them to be. Can you imagine just for a minute if Christ did that when he came to earth and became man? Did he ever once forget who he was? He always remembered he was God. He never once lapsed in judgment thinking, I'm somebody else. He remembered he was God at all times and every minute of the day. And because of that, people came to him. People joined him. And he healed people and he brought people to him, to his father. Because he never forgot who he was. He never forgot who he was. And he led those people in righteousness and truth and justice. Can you imagine just once, just for one day, if every one of us lived our life with complete humility? If we lived our life with complete forgiveness for everything that everybody's ever, ever done to us? If we lived our life for just one day, loving every single person that God has put into our small world, the way they were supposed to love them. Can you imagine what those people would see in us? But yet we're stuck, and we're selfish, and we're stiff-necked. And we refuse to change because we were wounded. But can you imagine if Christ did that to us? He was wounded for our iniquity. The consequences of sin was death on the cross for him. Our consequences of sin is a life without him. And that's worse than death. Because when Christ went to the cross and died, he knew who he was. He was sure of who he was. He was positive of who he was. And he knew that day when his creation was taking the hammer and nailing it him to the, to the cross and his creation had put that crown of thorns on him and whipped him and beat him and spit on him and abused him when he was hanging on the cross one of his final statements was forgive them father for they don't know what they're doing why don't we have that same attitude when we look at our spouses forgive him or her for they don't know what they're doing they crucified me they hurt me they wounded me but forgive them for what they don't know what they're doing because they need to become the people that you are calling them to be, Lord. And I need to be the person that you were to Matthew, son of Alphaeus, and Peter, the fisherman, and Andrew, the fisherman, and James, and John, and Thomas. I need to be that guy to those guys, to my spouse or my children or whoever it is in my life so that way I can shine my light even to the people that I'm supposed to be shining the brightest to. But we're stubborn. We're stiff-necked, and we refuse to be humble enough in order for us to do the things that we need to do. This day comes, right? Right before the cross, we celebrate, and right before last week, we celebrate on these Saturdays, the Saturdays of Souls. We seem to forget that all of us are just dust and ashes. And what's really important for us is our soul. And that's why, through God's grace, that we ask God to pray for the people that have gone before us because God forbid that he ends up not being merciful to them. Because he's always merciful. Even in his righteous judgment, even in his wrath, even in every aspect that we think, how can God be that way? We must remember that God is always God. And what he does to us and to his creation is a result of how we are to him and his creation as well. God have mercy on us for forgetting to take the beam out of our eye so we can see clearly enough to take the speck out of our spouse's eye, out of our children's eye, out of our friend's eye, out of my parishioner's eye, out of the people that we walk down the street with. God forbid 
and we are the church, sometimes we are the hardest people to love because when somebody offends you in the church, that person is supposed to be a Christian. That person is supposed to be who I expect them to be, but we seem to forget that we were broken and we are broken. And Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. If we can say that prayer with all honesty, we can start to look at the people in our lives in truth and honesty. If you truly, truly, truly seek God, you, every time this place is open, you will be here because you cannot do it on your own. Sunday mornings is not enough. Two times a week is not enough. Three times a week is not enough. Seven times a week is not enough. Nothing is ever going to be enough if you want to look for God. But if it is open, if St. Nicodemus says it is open, everybody should be breaking their backs to get here. But yet, something else comes to become more important than coming here. Why isn't the church full? Because something else is more pressing and more important than what it is for you. Our souls. Our souls are on the line. And Satan wants to destroy us at every turn. But yet, we want to be stubborn and stiff-necked and hard-hearted, and we don't want to look past the people and their sins and what they've done. Deny yourself Pick up the cross and follow me. That's what Jesus commands. There is no additions and there's no clauses to that. It doesn't say do that unless your spouse is irritating you. And don't do, do that unless your children are doing this. Do that unless the president is doing this. Do that unless the people of this world are doing this. Jesus does not give any amendments to his commandments. He says, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. If you love me, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength. And if you love me, you will love your neighbor as yourself. And the reason why you can't love your neighbor is because we don't love ourselves. And the reason why we don't love ourselves is because we truly don't love God. Because if we love God, we'd be following his commandments. Plain and simple. Don't tell me that you're struggling with your marriage and then you don't put God first because you know why that is. And then don't tell me that the things that are happening in your life are happening in your life because you are not putting God first. That is the reason, that is the only reason, because you are not humble, you are not stubborn, you are stubborn and stiff-necked, just like I am. I am the same way, I am the exact same way, just ask my wife. And it's taken a lot of time for me to come to the realization that I am such a self-centered, wretched sinner. So I can honestly say, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Amen. 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 Let us all say with our whole soul.